This is what's very interesting about codependency. What happens is you create the worst possible case scenarios in your mind. Maybe this person really doesn't like me and wants to get away from me. Maybe I have to shift myself and change myself in order for this person to like me more. Therefore, this person will stay. This person must be leaving. I must have said something wrong or I must have influenced this individual. You think of the worst and it happens almost like a flick of a light. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Flip Your Mindset, the podcast. My name is Stacey Yurig. I'm your host. And today's special guest is Vanessa Gordon. Some of you may know Vanessa. She's the CEO and publisher of East End Taste Magazine. It's a di digital publication based in the Hamptons. She's also the founder and host of the Hamptons Interactive Brunch, which if you haven't been, I've been following it, looks amazing. It's an annual summer event series that she hosts in New York. She holds a master's degree in education from NYU. She lives in the Hamptons with her family. But let me tell you why she wants to come on to this episode. Vanessa had contacted me because she wanted to share a story about codependency, where it stemmed from for her, how she discovered she was emotionally codependent, recognized it, and how it shaped her and the relationships she was going to have moving forward. And I think this is such a great topic because I think many people are very codependent in their relationships and they may not even know it. So today's goal is to really help Vanessa share her story, but also hopefully give some insight to the viewers and the listeners as to where and why they may be challenged in some of their own relationships. So welcome, Vanessa. Thank you so much for having me, Stacey. I'm so happy to have you. So let's just open it right up. What does codependency mean to you? And how did you recognize or become aware that this was a part of how you were in your relationships? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So I would say that for me, I didn't realize how significant codependency was until actually quite recently within the last six months or really that I had such a thing. But I know that I've had codependent tendencies, I would say through my early to mid teenage years. And I could talk about where that I believe stems mm -hmm. from. It's quite fascinating how, you know, how deep it is and how complicated codependency, where it really comes from and also unraveling it and healing from it because codependency is something that's learned. It's not necessarily, um, so it's not something we're, we're born with. It's that's a right. learned illness. Um, so now my process that I'm going through literally is unlearning how to be codependent yeah. and it's, I, I really describe it. It's like an addiction. You And what's interesting, too, is it doesn't necessarily affect who you're you know, in a relationship with or who your partner is, or in my case, my husband. Am I codependent with my husband? I believe at times I have been, but not right now. Interestingly, codependency for me has shifted to... Uh, friendships and relatives. How did you um, become aware yeah. that this was even the thing for you? Um, what was happening for you that caused you to have this shift in awareness? There were three significant or specific times that I've noticed it, but the first time was in uh, was in college, and I noticed this is now with my now husband. And we were in a, perhaps a, a I don't want to say a long distance relationship, but he was uh, finishing up his residency program in Philadelphia. And I was in college in a town called Purchase, New York, which is about a half hour from the city. And I would not be able to function in a sense unless he were with me. So I would, you know, even, you know, make up stories or situations that he had to come see me. Um, everything from my gosh, I, I, think, you know, something, go, you know, whether, whatever, whatever it was, it was never anything major per se, but that I needed him, that I needed him there. And he would, you know, take away time from his extraordinarily, you know, ta taxing schedule and would, would come see me or I would come see him. And I remember one time we were away from each other. I know this sounds like nothing now, but I think it was about three weeks and that was the longest span of time. And 
is not going to this relationship is not going to work unless you you know look inside yourself and figure out what you know you need to focus on yourself but what's interesting is even as a physician he never said the, what the word codependency he says you need to become more self-reliant he used other uh terms or expressions with me but when it when it clicked is when i fostered and developed you know, stronger friendships in college. It actually took me a while to get to know people because my schedule was so demanding. I was taking over 20 credits at the time and really, really working as, and then in addition to that, working three different jobs, one on campus and two off campus. So my schedule was very demanding. So I really didn't have much of a social life right away in college. So, and we were dating right away. So when he pulled away, then I developed friendships. I'm like, oh, stronger friendships, everything was, was fine. However, then I became attached to other individuals. Mm -hmm. So it was just a never ending cycle. So that was the first part. And then I'll, then the second part is, so my husband was a, was a, what's called a functioning alcoholic for many, many years. Uh, we were, we've been married now more than 12 years, been together 16 years, but in the first, my goodness, to what would that be? You know, fourteen plus years together. He had this secret illness that that I hid. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't want anyone. Nobody. Nobody knew. Um, it was actually until one day a girlfriend of mine came over to see me. We we're going to a gala together, and she noticed my husband acting funny while he was beyond intoxicated. And our babysitter hadn't arrived, and I had to leave. And in a sense, I was taking a risk leaving. Um, you know, without the baby, so they're here because my son, my daughter was at sleepaway camp and my son was home. My son was only four at the time, but thankfully the babysitter arrived because, but I kept saying to Chris, like, oh no, no, go upstairs, go lie down, go lie down. You're not feeling well, go lie down. And because I did not want my friend to see him intoxicated. And then of course, sure enough, my, my friend noticed and she said, Vanessa, your husband smelled like alcohol. And I said, oh, he, oh, he probably, oh, he probably just had something something to drink. And, but she knew, she says, was he, he, she was out. Then she started asking questions, but what was so interesting is at that time, did you know that I would not even, I was almost immune to the smell of alcohol. Mm. I didn't, I, I, it was, so, I would only even be able to tell he was intoxicated if he were inebriated practically. Yeah, I, I actually wouldn't be able to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so and a good it. functioning alcoholic will do that. I've had mm -hmm. family members were the same thing. You know, like, and then I was like, well, wow, when was the last time I actually saw this person sober then? Like, if this person seems sober right. to me now, right, and I find out that they're well beyond that, um, you know, it's a really interesting and scary data point, really. And what's interesting is people, you know, perhaps people seem to be like, wow, why are you, you're speaking about your husband this way? Wow, you're being quite open. Well, it, the reason why is because to be very honest, this affects Every type of individual, um, whatever career, background, et cetera, way of life, it affects so many people. And I think people should be more aware that it's unfortunately all too common. Thankfully, now he is sober and he's been sober for well over a year. He's still in what's called active recovery. Um, but it was quite a long, long journey. But, but I developed a an intense connection with um, the interventionist that I had sought help from. And that relationship, or whatever it was, perhaps, was also extraordinarily unhealthy. But I knew that after everything ceased, I'll just say, that mm -hmm. I, we stopped talking to one another. Um, and I didn't realize that, that I was, because I was so starved for emotional attention mm -hmm. that was lacking, that all of a sudden, this individual who ended up developing a friendship with, it became, I'll just say it became complicated from there. But what's interesting is I literally latched onto this individual. And in a way, this other individual latched onto me too. Mm -hmm. The situation, I'll just say, was anything but professional. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, and of course, at my most vulnerable time, right. sharing the most vulnerable bits of my life with this person that I sought essentially professional help from in the very beginning, um, it's like unra you're unraveling your life to this person, of course, you're going to become attached as someone who is codependent. And that's almost, I won't say lethal, but it's, it's, qu it's close in that sense. When was the and first time you under, you heard the word codependency and connected the dots for yourself? 
So I recently met a a wonderful individual um, uh, locally where I live, um, and he experienced, you know, we 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 de- we've developed a friendship and he I can't say anything but the best about this person but um he had opened up to me and said that he had um emotional codependent tendencies but he's now um a fo- he calls himself now a former codependent but I of course you know my codependent tendencies latched onto him uh, upon learning that this individual was going to be going away for a little while and doing some traveling. And um, I, because I was developing this close connection with this person that all of a sudden I find out that they're just going away, which in hindsight, but no big deal. They're, they're just going away. I do it all the time. Um, I, I became almost beside myself and I said, no, 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 I'm going to be traveling to, as well, let me we could we could figure something out. You don't have to be away for so long. And then, then I was actually trying to convince the person, well, why are you even going away at all? Um, and he actually used the term Vanessa that you're you are showing signs of what's called of codependency. And he literally we pulled it apart. We were on the phone, you know, in person for quite a while speaking about this. And he's right. I mean, he's it's interesting too, is he's a lot, he's, I would say a lot younger than me, but there's, there's an age, there's an age difference where I'm quite impressed by someone that is perhaps not as, you know, worldly mature or ha- has, um, the experience that I do in life was able to recognize those traits in me. But mm-hmm. if it weren't for him, actually, I probably would not be now on this pathway to healing because he actually said the word. And for me, I'm so glad that someone actually had the, you know, stood up and actually said that. And that's what who a, who a true friend is, someone that actually calls it out and says it. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I have two pretty specific questions. So the first sure. is because if someone's listening and they don't really know what codependency looks like, what were some of the things that this friend was pointing out to you that were signs of potential codependency tendencies. Absolutely. And of course, do I, so he actually sent me a very detailed text message and I applaud him for that. He, he did not have to do this. So he actually said, put it into, I'll say bullet points, but little phrases, if you will thing. So he pointed out specifically, didn't want him to be away for so long to think back a little bit. Um, yes, didn't want me to be away for so long, um, that I was, oh, the, the big, the biggest concept was that I was willing to move around. I had a trip. I was, I, I went to Austria and Vienna recently that I was willing and able to move around my trip to coincide with his trip. Um, which I know sounds a little bit odd and bizarre now in hindsight thinking about it, but I was in this moment of just dismay and despair and you will, which like I said, it's so, it's so uh, as I'm healing from this, it almost seems so strange looking back, like, why, why would I say that? How why would that I do that show up in your system, Vanessa? Like when you use terms like sure. dismayed and despair, how do you know that you were in those states? What did it feel like in your nervous system to hear this person's going to be going away and you're not going to be able to see them. Or even going back to when your husband was first in residency and you were dating and you were saying Mm -hmm. you create these situations in order to see each other. What was it that was happening internally in your system that was making you so uncomfortable that you wanted to shift everything in order to try to to ease that discomfort, really. This is what's very interesting about codependency. You are literally, and this is another thing that my my friend gave, my younger friend gave an example of. Um, it's like in the, I guess, Latin American culture, there's this term or phrase of creating films in your mind. Uh, la, la películas, and yeah. he explained it to me in Spanish. And... You, you couldn't have described it any clearer than that. But what happens is, and I can describe it best with the most recent instance, is you create the worst possible case scenarios in your mind 
maybe this person really doesn't like me and wants to get away from me. Maybe I have to shift myself and change myself in order for this person to like me more. Therefore, this person will stay. This person must be leaving. I must have said something wrong or I must have influenced this individual. Um, and then looking back with my husband, oh, maybe he has some, you know, not necessarily, I never really thought he was cheating or had somebody else, but maybe he doesn't really want to be with me. It was more focused in the relationship itself as opposed to being concerned about out, you know, outward or outlying situations. Um, you think of the worst and it happens almost like the, a flick of a light. So for instance, it wouldn't matter if that person sent me a message say yesterday, like, lo- you know, love spending time with you. We had, you know, have so much fun looking, you know, looking forward, you know, you would pick apart that sit and read the text and pick it apart going, they don't really mean that, do they? Or, or mm-hmm. listen, someone will send a phrase, I'm sure I will see you when I return. I'm sure I will. Well, why are you sure? What's so sure? Right. That how, what, who are you to say? And you're picking it apart in the worst case. Sarah, what's so interesting too is I'll say this, and I'm hoping that this, that this right here helps others tremendously that may be struggling with this. I cannot tell you the amount of times I have nitpicked something, drew up the worst case scenario, and the whole time it was actually not only a neutral situation, it was actually quite a positive uh, case scenario. It was actually very positive. And how to describe it, you know, from literal sense, it's like you're dumping mud on something that's glitter pristine and fine yeah. exactly that why why am i doing this and it's so unhealthy and that's what's unhealthy about what codependency creates so thank you so much for sharing that and creating that picture for the listener from a, a trauma coaching perspective i'd like to share a little bit about what i'm hearing and then ask a pretty bold question so you know I do a lot of parts work, right? So no one's born feeling this type of anxiety. And it really is a type of anxiety. And I always say anxiety is really not a feeling. It's a state of being, right? And it's a state of being that's exhausting. Let's face it. So there's this heightened sense of pulling things apart. We're not born that way. We're actually born centered, calm, believing connection is available to us, connected to ourselves really healthily and securely. We're usually very confident within ourselves. We're very courageous within ourselves. And then it could be very early on in life. Um, But at some point, we start observing how we are connecting to other people, typically caretakers, and or not connecting, and we start to make decisions about our value and our worth, and then we develop parts of us to protect us from the pain of potentially not feeling that connection, right? You've got it. Right. Yes. And so the bold question I have to ask you is when did your fear of abandonment and rejection start? Because to me, that looks like very clearly from my seat, the biggest wound that this part was trying to protect you from. Exactly right. So in that sense, you know, by creating the worst case scenarios, you, I will then not be disappointed if this situation on, on, unravels Assuming in, in a negative would. way or falls apart. Right, exactly. Because here's the thing, when, when we develop these parts and everybody does it, Okay. It just comes up in a different flavor of gelato is what I always say. It's like everybody has these same challenges. It just shows up differently. Somebody else might have a fear of rejection, but they're not super codependent. There's extreme people pleaser and lack of boundary setter, right? Like everybody comes up with the appropriate coping strategy in the moment. And then when it's reinforced as working, we just harness it. It's like typical cause and effect. So When we're not securely attached or we have this fear of rejection and abandonment, it changes the lens through which we see everything. I say to people, imagine you're driving a car and you have sludge on your windshield, right? And no matter what you do, no matter how much windshield fluid you use, it just continues to make a mess. Nothing's clear. So you're seeing yourself 
through this lens of not worthy of connection, which by the way, totally under the subconscious realm, it's not like a conscious thought, right? But the feeling is worry of, am I enough, right? And then we now, because we're interacting with ourselves that way, we then interact with others through that lens and we interact with the whole world through that lens. So where and how and when did that start for you, do you think? I definitely believe it started very early on in my childhood. Mm -hmm. Um, My childhood was certainly not, it was not, bad. I actually had a very decent upbringing. I grew up in a very, you know, affluent, you know, home. And, um, you know, my dad was very, you know, successful. Um, he he was married twice before, um, my mom was married once before. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's funny is when I tell stories about my family, people think, Oh wow, you're quite the storyteller. And I'm like, no, (laughs) this is very real. (laughs) A lot, a lot of story. Oh, it's, it, I, we could be, but it, you know, I would say my, my grandparents were really the ones who raised me. And then, um, my brother's I think, about, uh, just under six years younger than I am. And, you know, I spent much of my childhood in a sense, raising him. Um, I was left with him, with my grandparents and my grandfather, you know, who's in his eighties, he would fall asleep you know, mm-hmm. take snaps. And, you know, I, if anything happened to my brother, or something there was something wrong between us. It was always my fault. Um, I was chronic. I was always, always picked up late from activity. It was so chronic. Um, I actually would have to lie. Mm-hmm. Um, I would actually told by my counsel, you know, my coaches ca- lie to my, to my mother in particular saying that we end the game or the match ends or this program ends an hour before. Mm. And um, I don't know if you ever remember the movie Save the Last Dance that came out in 2000, but my mother would always use the example of, I'm going to give it away. I'm just going to give it away now. Uh, Plot. (laughs) Uh, Spoiler. But anyway, in the beginning of the movie, the mother dies in a car crash because she's rushing around trying to get from, I guess, her job to her daughter's recital. Um, So my mother would always use that scene in the film as see what will happen to me yeah once she actually showed up like a little early and she had to wait and she says i'm not waiting for you i'm your mother i don't have to wait for you Mm. you wait for me there's and she says you remember who i am and that's all i did i mean i remember there was not a not one day i remember all the my friend's parents were waiting in the hallway of the school that's back when the parents could actually go physically in the schools but anyway they would be right there and i would always have to wait in the main office for a solid amount of time enough where i would just it would be it would be to a point where the janitors would be sitting waiting right. with me and this is going back to elementary school and you know and i i would have these horrible visions of what if no one ever showed yes. up to pick me up but that's the thank and, you for uh, sharing this because yep. Yep. You know, that's one of many. Yeah, but, but it but it's powerful and it's profound yeah. for me, and and I hope it is for the listeners yeah. too. And this is why, and this is why I do what I do as a trauma recovery coach. I find myself more in the educator space than anything when I'm sitting with my clients, right? Yeah. So if I have somebody coming to me and saying, "I don't really understand why I'm so stuck," you know, I know you deal with trauma, mm. but I didn't have any trauma. You know, I, there was no abuse. There was no aggression. There was no violence. And I say, okay, well, just imagine if trauma were a weather pattern, right? Everybody knows a tsunami, a hurricane, a tornado, some of these major weather events, people can look at it and assume that the people that are in the wake of that major weather event are going to experience something really devastating, And it would be, I'm going to put quote unquote traumatic, right? But what about people who live in a place where never gets sun and it's just dark and rainy all the time, you know, maybe 300 days a year, or maybe a place where it's just hot, you know, three digit degrees, 300 days a year, right? Where they're not Mm -hmm. um, having these acute crazy big blowups or these huge weather storms, but it's this constancy of dysfunctional weather. 
that has a yeah. profound impact on someone's life and it leaves them feeling a certain way. What I understand trauma to be is never the event. Trauma is never what happened. It's the interpretation it causes you to believe. And it's the feelings associated with that interpretation that keep you stuck. So if I were to say to you, how did those moments leave you feeling in that moment? Like Sitting, sitting back and thinking about being in that office where the last people that are there are you and the janitor, what would you, that younger Vanessa have been feeling in that moment? Really wondering what, you know, it's funny, it's my, my mother didn't work, you know, she, but she loved to, you know, you know, go out, go shopping, just do activities, whatever. You know, didn't really have a hobby per se, um, but, you know, wondering like, what in heaven, what are you doing that you can't come pick me up? We lived literally five minutes away from the house. And I know from that, I am, it is, I'm so acutely aware that I never, if I can help it, let my children wait yeah. ever. But I'm going to, I'm going to hold you it's to this. For- I asked you what your yeah. feeling was and you told me I was thinking you know, where is she? What could she be doing? That's a thought. What was the feeling that you may have had in that moment? Oh, the feeling? Yeah. Oh, I mean, the January situation only happened a handful of times, but it was it was quite profound. Let's put it, it was more or less with uh, her, her name was Mary. I mean, she, um, she was the one of the secretaries in the office. She was usually who I was sitting with. Um that was lo- real lo- just lonely and just Yeah, so lonely. Just really- But but perhaps open to seeking other you know connections. Yeah. I, that's why I think. But how do you think you felt in that moment no. when everybody else's parents are able to make it on time, come and pick up their kid? You're feeling lonely. How else are you feeling in that moment? I'm saying a little, and and in, in a certain degree, I would certainly say unworthy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would say unworthy because I will tell even to this day, my parents have never acknowledged any, mm-hmm. any, um, anything it's I've function. ever achieved, accomplished. Uh, no. Oh, yeah. Well, no. here's the thing. I, uh, feelings as a young child are strong, right? So I can't put into yeah. your mouth or your words what you were feeling in that time, but I'm sure the feelings were profound. And what the studies show from a neuroscience perspective and how we relate to ourselves from attachment point of view, Mm -hmm. whenever we find ourselves in circumstances where we feel unseen, unheard, insignificant, unimportant, before the age of nine, it leads us to believe that we're not enough. And that's heavy. And so what I often say, and I've said it before in another podcast is this, what I'm starting to see on my couch when people come to visit me or when I'm having zoom coaching calls is this concept of silence over violence. When I don't feel seen and heard and valuable as a part of this, we only have a handful of things that we need as young kids. Keep me fed, keep me hydrated, keep a a healthy roof over my head, meaning like I'm you know, Mm -hmm. safe from the elements, keep me clean. Yeah. But more important than any of that is I need to know I am significant in this unit of origin, in this family of origin, that I belong, that I matter, uh, that I'm loved just for Mm -hmm. being a part of this family. And that piece right there is what I see the most not the aggression, not the abuse, not the violence. Yeah. I see that too. Don't get me wrong. But this, exactly yeah. what you're talking about, I'm going to call it a non-malignant on the outside event, right? That has a profound yeah. and basically very long lasting impact into adulthood, mm-hmm. right? Right. So for people that are listening, it's really important to understand 
trauma is never the event. So when I talk about trauma, and I think I talk about it so much, people are like, oh my God, please, more with the trauma. Trauma is not an action. It is how it caused you to view yourself and others in the world around you that's keeping you stuck in life. Because all that trauma is, is a wound. So it could be a physical wound. It could be an emotional wound. One's no worse or better than the other. And when we're walking around with these emotional wounds of that hurt, when that person didn't show up, because that sent me the message, I don't matter as much. I need to know that I matter. That's profound. And then we come up with a whole bunch of coping strategies, many of which we get very praised for perfectionism, lack of boundary setting, you know, helping others to the death, but at our own expense, we get praised for those things, but they keep us very unfulfilled and very stuck because it's like chasing the dragon. We're just trying to fill that void. When I say that, how does that resonate with you? Yeah, no, that's, that's the, when you, especially when you said chasing the drag, you're chasing something. It's, it's unreasonable. It's, and whether, whether that's something you want to attain, but also these, like I said, these emotions are completely and entirely that they're completely, you know, they're confabulated. It's, it's absolutely unreasonable yeah. to think this way so me, and it's only dragging you Yeah, a hundred percent. So where do you go from here? What have you been learning about yourself? What kind of things have you been doing to, hmm go from that radical awareness to that radical acceptance and start liberating yourself from this way of connecting with people. Sure. I'll definitely share what I've noticed has helped with me. And these are, you know, you know, general tips. Um, I would say cutting off time, you know, time from social media has been quite significant. I, I don't scroll at all. I don't, I rarely, I don't spend much time and I actually have a 30 minute timer and it has to be work related and there has to be a call to action or purpose. It can't just be mindless. Why are you on say Facebook, for instance? Uh, what is your, what's your point of going on? Oh yes. Yeah, somebody posted, there was a call about some work group or event. You want to respond to that. Okay. There has to be a reason, you know, whatever, whatever, um, the platform X, are you tweeting or are you just reading? Anyway, it has to be a certain call to action. Um, I also started, I started journaling, which is interesting is I was journaling from really when I was kidding, I was creating little characters and stories and drawings that was my little out, my outlet, even at that young age. And I started that again. The one thing, though, for me, it's interesting is I really I got this really cool journal. It's called the Manny Scripting Journal. But um, what's neat about it is I like I prefer journals that stick just to stay positive. Um, what's interesting is I, I love this journal a lot. The one thing that I have not delved into yet is it actually encourages you to write down just things you want to get rid of in your life or thoughts or how, you know how to fix it. For the life of me, I cannot write down anything negative if it's going to be in a book. If it's going to be something negative, I have to write down a scrap of paper and put it in my shredder mm-hmm. and watch it shred. I can't sit right so that's neg. I don't. I don't know. Maybe it's just in my way of thinking. I don't know. Is it still those codependent? Like, well, if I write it, then it's re- you know, and then this cycle that I go mm-hmm. through. So maybe that's just yet another layer that I have to heal mm-hmm. before I mm-hmm. get there. Um, one thing is just, you know, if I'm missing to where I want to, you know, be with someone or talk, you know, reach out, um, you know, people say, oh, well, just call them. Just not, not, not for a code. Don't tell that to a code person because that's not, it's, it's funny is, you know, for a normal, a normal person, or someone that doesn't have codependency, that's fine. You could, yeah, go text them a call, but not for me. You no, know, you should not do that. Actually, it should actually there actually should be a, again, a call to action or a, a reason, a reason, because then you go down that rabbit hole of a very, I don't want to say funny, but this, this is also something that I've experienced is I'll text someone and I'll say, Hey, you want to get together or, you know, what, what, what you doing this week? And if they don't answer, like within the first right. 10 minutes, I'm like, Oh God, and I knew what they didn't like me. Yeah. There's something wrong. Oh no. 
Oh, and then all of a sudden, then again, and it go, and then it's horrible. Mm. It's horrible, and I just don't want to. Do, I just don't. Uh, so it's and then again. Anyway, this is all perhaps in my healing process. So I'm not quite there yet. So like I said, I have to either be very busy with work or I have to have other responsibilities. Then, ironically, I will message someone and see if they're free because I'm like, well, if they don't answer me right away, or if, like, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter because I have stuff mm-hmm. I have to do anyway. So it's it's all part of the healing process, I I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been such a great a great conversation, and I haven't really had anybody come in specifically to talk about codependence, and so I I'm very grateful um, for a variety of reasons. But always one is just to give my listeners and the people that you know, subscribe to the podcast, another way in which these dysfunctions growing up can hinder and impact us into adulthood. And it's really important for people to understand. And I say this all the time, nobody's broken and nobody is too, I'm going to use the term screwed up or fucked up to be healed because I hear that a lot. No, no. All that I want people to know is that every experience we have growing up, every experience we have before the age of 18 impacts the way that we interact with the world. And really, it's not 18. It's really the experiences we have by the time we're like 9, 10, 11. They're impactful. The developmental years really are the platform through which you navigate life. And the different parts that you develop in order to navigate life. And so when you can understand that, when you get into your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, hopefully your 20s, right? Right. But sometimes we don't have that kind of awareness yet. Um, Right. There are ways to go back and say, what is this coping strategy, right? I see codependency as a coping strategy, What is this coping strategy? Why did I decide to harness this? When did I decide to harness this? And what can I do differently? And anybody can do differently. It's why I do hypnosis with my clients because it's very powerful. And I have ways that I can help them shift from that belief system of, I need to be this way in relationships because if I'm not then they may not come back and I can't bear the wound of being abandoned emotionally, not physically one more time. Right. Once we can get to that root, we can start to create new beliefs. Your belief system that was formed by the nine, you're nine or 10. It's not fixed. Yeah. You created it. You can create a new one, but you have to become radically aware that you're doing it. So I love that you have good friends that made you radically aware. I love the fact that you were open enough to allow yourself to hear it. Because I think there were a lot of people that would have said, fuck you. I'm not codependent. And maybe you did say that at one point. Yeah. It's it's, it's funny too is, oh, yeah, I, I was... I don't, like I said, I don't know if this is relatable to codependency or this fear of abandonment, but I've never, it's very rare that I've told someone to their face that I could think of right away that, no, you're, that's actually not true. Wait, no, <laughs> no, I was just thinking that. I, that no, I actually have many times. But I you know, there about? are people say, who are deathly afraid of using their voice. That they're very, very yes. fearful of sharing an opinion. And I had somebody once come sit down for a session and I said, um, use th- it was the first time we met. And I said, use three words to describe yourself, just so I can get to understand you a little yeah. bit better. And one of the words she used was, I'm very go with the flow. And I leaned over uh, and I said, that's cool. Very cool. go with the flow. I said, I'm just going to throw this out there. Is it go with the flow or is it I'm too afraid to voice my opinion on what I want as to where we go, what we eat, how we show up, what we hang out yeah. with for fear of 
upsetting that person, losing that person. And when I said that, she was like, oh my God. And I was like, but you harness, you create this story of just super go yeah. with the flow. But really it could be, I'm not saying it's always this way for people. I don't have an opinion because my opinion doesn't yeah. matter. And, or I'm afraid yeah. to express it. Right. That is a very common right. aftermath of even just the situation that you explained. Right. 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 Yeah. This has been amazing. Thank you so much um, for coming on and sharing your story. I think it's one that's actually pretty global and universal. I think more people are struggling with this than they'd like to admit. So my hope today is that if someone's listening and Vanessa's story and experience resonated with you, find someone that you can go to that you can feel safe to share your truth, right? It could be me, it could be Vanessa even, um, somebody that can hold some space and allow you to start to process and gain that radical awareness that I've been talking about. Is there anything you'd like to share as we wrap up today? Thank you so much for having me. I had, um, it was very enlightening to discuss this very openly. Um, um, people may not realize that, you know, uh, that I am actually quite open, you know, people reach out and talk to me about so many different, um, scenarios and, um, parts of their lives. And I keep, you know, just out of, I keep everything in confidence. Um, and I'm always happy to help in any way that I can, because I think what's, what truly is, and again, so fascinating is that we all experience something like this. Or you know, or things in some way, shape, or form that are that affect us, um, you know, on a daily, you know, more yeah. often than we think. Exactly. Um, you know, people, you know, like I said, I I hid, you know, my my husband's alcoholism for years, yeah. years and years and years. Nobody knew. Nobody. I think if, like I even said, to them, if I told close colleagues of his, um, they would be shocked. They wouldn't believe me. I don't think they'd believe yeah. me. Well, you've been raw, so. honest, real greatly yeah. appreciate that because we need more of that right, in the world. Yeah, we do. We, we really, really, really do. do. So I applaud <laughs> you and I'm grateful for your courage because it takes a lot of courage sometimes to show up in our truth and our authentic self. So thank you so much. And guys, if you want to know more about Vanessa, I'll put all of the information about who she is, her businesses, so you can check her out because it is pretty amazing to watch. It's fun and inspiring. Um, I'll put those all in the show notes. And if you like today's episode, please consider subscribing to Flip Your Mindset. We drop a new podcast every single week where we're sharing stories of adversity and hope. And we also have experts on to talk about mental health. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm.